I think that when most people watch a movie, they want the good people to win, the bad people to lose, and to understand what just happened. They want a clear plot, physical goals, and every action spoken out loud by sexy famous people. It's the movie equivalent of me eating my favorite macaroni and cheese. I don't want my food to confuse me or challenge me, but I do want that in a film. So join me as I examine David Cronenberg's Videodrome in this week's Analytical Filmmaking Analysis of the Week. By the way, this is a segment from The Carl King Show. If you enjoy this video, remember to like and subscribe and send us burritos. This week's analytical filmmaking analysis of the week is David Cronenberg's Videodrome from 1983, screenwrited and directed by David Cronenberg himself. When it comes to food, I have simple tastes. I can eat the same macaroni and cheese over and over. It's a simple flavor and texture, and I want it to be the exact same experience every time. Because I already found what I like. I don't want my food to challenge me or trick me. So I can understand why people feel the same way about movies. They want the good people to win, the bad people to lose, and to understand what just happened. They want a clear plot, physical goals, and everything spoken out loud by sexy, famous people. It's the movie equivalent of me eating my macaroni and cheese, and I call that type one. And then there are the films of David Cronenberg, which I call type two. Those are full of surprise, abstraction, ambiguity, subtlety, non-linearity, ironic counterpoint, and conspicuous slowness. And if you are looking for those, you'll find many of them in Videodrome. Unfortunately, most people just want their macaroni and cheese movies. So Videodrome was a box office bomb, while Cronenberg's previous release, Scanners, brought in $14.2 million. Videodrome only brought in $2.1 million. And that's bad because film studios and investors, like anybody, don't like losing money, especially millions of dollars. Yet in every way possible, Videodrome is a more sophisticated film. Let's start with the plot. James Woods runs a... TV channel that broadcasts softcore porn, <laughs> and he finds out about an underground show called Videodrome, and he wants to acquire it for his station. But aside from that, he's not an active protagonist. He actually stumbles into another plot, which is not even driven by him. It turns out the Videodrome show he wants is actually created by an anti-pornography group and they're using sort of brainwashing technology to kill their viewers. So anyone who watches their show gets brain tumors, hallucinates, and dies. And the reason they're doing this is to cleanse society of people who watch pornography. But that makes it a circular thing where they're causing the exact thing they're trying to stop. Anyway, the Videodrome guys want to take over his TV station to broadcast their mental virus. And since James Woods has been watching Videodrome himself, he catches that mental virus. And he begins to hallucinate, and the film gets pretty surreal from then on. Still, beneath all of that surrealism, it's based on a solid Type 1 plot. There are some bad guys with a secret plan, and our main character gets caught up in it. So let's talk about some of the type two elements in this film. Surprise, abstraction, and ambiguity. Starting with surprise, some of the surprising moments are, number one, there's that whole body horror thing going on with James Woods growing a female sexual organ on his torso, and various videotapes are inserted into him like a VCR, and the tapes brainwash him turning him into an assassin. Number two, in a later scene, a villain inserts a videotape into James Woods, and when he pulls his hand back out, 
His hand transformed into a fleshy grenade. And James Woods says, See you in Pittsburgh. And the guy explodes. What? Now, whether those things are happening in the reality of the film, or if he is just hallucinating them all at that point, we don't know yet. Now, let's move on to abstraction. That's where, for example, a gun might not just be a physical gun. It might represent something else. So type 2 films deal with these sorts of symbolism and themes. And what are those themes in Videodrome? First up would be video's negative effect on society, possibly brainwashing us or controlling our minds. And Cronenberg was influenced by the ideas of the philosopher Marshall McLuhan, or McLuhan, who was a professor at the University of Toronto when Cronenberg attended college there. So the first and most prominent theme is this. In a modern multimedia world, we might have trouble distinguishing the real from the virtual. And I don't know about you, but I can't wait for those new Apple augmented reality goggles so I can see advertisements projected on every surface in the entire world. And second, there is the theme of an art form, misvolving. <laughs> and if you didn't catch my explanation in the earlier segment, here it is again. I'm sure you've heard of the concept of evolution, where a species will adapt its features over time in order to survive. And there's also de-evolution, which is the concept of a species moving backwards from a previous form. But what if something could misvolve? <laughs> Meaning, if it were to adapt and transform into something we don't want, something bad. I used this term earlier to explain how music, in an attempt to survive, adapted by trying to become a visual art. And in the case of this story, a softcore porno TV station driven by capitalist incentives misvolved into broadcasting actual torture and murder. And third, it creatively explores the ideas of artificial intelligence and transhumanism. There's a character named Brian Oblivion, a media prophet inspired by author Marshall McLuhan. And Oblivion has achieved immortality by recording himself speaking on camera and then storing his consciousness as a massive library of videotapes. And those tapes are then sent to TV stations for live appearances or as personal messages to friends. Meanwhile, no one knows that Mr. Oblivion died long ago. It's like an analog version of Ray Kurzweil. And finally, there's ambiguity. At the end of the film, we get a type 2 ambiguous conclusion, meaning we have no idea what really happened to James Woods. By that point in the story, he's hallucinating so deeply, all we can do is speculate. Now, I'm pretty sure that this is the film where David Cronenberg became <laughs> David Cronenberg. I looked back at Scanners and The Brood and Rabid back in the 70s, and I think Videodrome was the beginning of the path that led to the surrealism of Naked Lunch, Existence, and my favorite Cronenberg film, Crimes of the Future, the one from 2022. So I gave Videodrome five out of five stars and a little heart on Letterboxd. That's it for this week's analytical filmmaking analysis of the week. If you like this video, support the creation of more by joining my Patreon for $1 or $5 a month. That's patreon.com slash Carl King. Hey.